Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on when you're watching this. Um, I am Frank Dotzer, and this is our second episode of A Conversation. And I am super lucky today to have Mark Metcalf. Mark and I met years ago on an independent film, and I've kept in touch with him. And uh, I feel especially lucky to be able to talk to someone who's been in the industry as long as he has and has the experience he has. So, Mark, how are you doing today? I'm doing, um, uh, all things considered, I'm doing fine. Great, great, great. But and, there's a to consider. Yeah, you know, and I know you're in the midst of a move, and there's all kinds of things happening here, so I really appreciate uh, you taking the time. Oh, that's all right. I mean, it's like in these days of, uh, of COVID-19, uh, we have a lot of time. But we experience time in some way. I am, anyway, experiencing time in a very in a very different way, an odd way. It's like I'm in Vegas, but there are no free drinks. Yeah, isn't it? <laughs> the, uh, you know, and, and yeah, not to ignore the elephant in the room here, too. And, and, you know, I don't want to minimize all the things that are happening around. But this, you know, this conversation uh, that I bring is kind of for people that are in the industry. How do you think, Mark, this is going to affect production of movies and theater and everything moving forward what what you know what would you predict to to see this i know nobody really knows but what do you what are you thinking is going to happen here you know frank i i really don't know um everything i've, I've pretty much been separated from hollywood for a long time i have friends out there but apparently everything down out there is just shut down completely um I work uh, as an actor in the theater whenever I get a chance. And I've been working a bit as a dancer lately. And I have friends here in the dance community in Ohio, where I live, who are putting on dances outside. Uh, they, you know, people, creative people can't stop creating. So creative people will keep creating in some way. Performers will keep performing in some way. But I don't know what it'll be like. Smaller venues, I suspect, for quite a while until uh, the, 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 the great words going around now, until there's a once there's a vaccine, assuming there is a vaccine, assuming a vaccine can actually do anything about a coronavirus uh, like this one, and, and everybody seems to think it can, so we'll see. But... Um, the uh, what am I what am I trying to say? Oh, uh, until there's a vaccine, we've got a year, a year and a half, and things are going to be very different. Obviously, in the meantime, I have no idea what it's going to be like. Yeah. If it changes Hollywood in an absolute way, where people are making smaller, less expensive movies that are more about human beings, it couldn't happen to a nicer town. Um, if, it, if there's more sort of small theater, intimate theater with, you know, 15 people in the audience and the actors are five feet away from the audience, I, I love that kind of theater. That's what I like. That's how I like to work. So it could all have a silver lining. Who knows? Well, you know, I, I think you're right. And I, you know, even away from uh, entertainment and media, I'm sure you've seen the stories of, you know, places like uh, Venice where... The canals are all, uh, you know, settled now and there's dolphins in the canals and then people can see fish swimming and, you know, there's not as many planes in the air. And it's, you know, it's almost like uh, the earth forced us into a reset. Yeah, somebody uh, somebody sent me a, uh, a photograph from Yosemite where, the, you know, coyotes and wolves and, and the animals are coming back. And, and right away, as soon as humans sort of leave it be... Uh, nature not that humans aren't part of nature uh starts coming back in so yeah pollution is down uh, our carbon footprint is down all kinds of good things so maybe we'll take that away from this and learn from it i don't know i hope so i mean as a society as a culture as a global culture um that would be nice wouldn't it yeah, if we actually nice. learn something from, uh, yeah from that, the that would that would be great but of course history tells us uh we have a pretty short memory right yeah, we do. And when I say something like that, I feel really foolish because, yeah, yeah we don't. And certainly our leaders don't seem to learn anything. I'm with you on that. That's that's for a whole nother show, though. We can go down that road together, I'm sure. Um, yeah. 
a you know it, and now you you know you talk about the smaller venues and, and things like that and and I'm not sure if uh, if this is anything you get involved in or know about but you know I'm I'm wondering if things are going to be driven more towards um, you know kind of the social media uh, distribution of like YouTube and and things like that where people are watching them on their phones or or you know I mean you can still you can get it on your iPad. And, you know, and watching entertainment more like that, because you can't really gather right now. And it's going to be a while until we can kind of gather and experience those things in a theater or, or things like that. And so I'm wondering if stuff's going to be pushed to to uh, to those more personal, uh, personal ways to, to view entertainment and education and things. Oh, I think obviously it's already going that way. I mean, I'm, I have friends who are teaching dance classes um it, with Zoom, I took a dance class this morning through Zoom. Um, it's uh, and I, you know I'm old; I'll be dead before this is all over, probably. But uh, you're going to outlive uh, us all, Mark. Don't say that. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm thinking it'll probably take another ten or fifteen years to sort of process everything we've learned here, um, and maybe I won't be. Who knows? But. Um, we're what was I talking about? You're talking, oh, yeah. yep. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, I can't remember now. Don't refer. Well, for, you were going, going down the road of you think things are being pushed more towards those. Uh, like yes. So, so it's very it's hard for me to take a dance class when I can't smell the person next to me, yeah. or I can't hear them breathing, or I can't uh, actually feel the heat from their body. Uh, it's hard for me to do a dance, and it's and I don't know how I would do. A friend of mine is organizing a, a reading of a screenplay of his, uh, and other friends I know are doing readings of plays using Zoom, and and there are other platforms besides Zoom. I suspect I don't mean to keep pumping that one. That's just the one I'm familiar with. So, but if you can't smell the person and you can't feel the heat from their body and you can't hear their breathing, there's a big part of the experience that's missing. I mean, one of the things that I love most about the live theater is that you're in the room with all these people and you can you can sense their energy and you can sense their their being and they can sense yours more than just through sight and sound. Yeah, I, so I totally if, agree with you, Mark. And, and, and I think, you know, that's all driven towards the social media platforms. Yeah, I. I I just hope it doesn't stay that way. I hope we don't yeah. forget how to reach out and touch someone as some big corporation used to their for their advertising once upon a time. Well, I think, you know, I think evidence to that, too, for for the uh, for the population is, you know, movie theaters. Right. I mean, they've been they've been saying the demise of movie theaters are coming for years. Um, yeah. People still go gather in a movie theater because. Watching a movie with even you know strangers you're not interacting with directly, uh, it's a whole different feeling, isn't it? Oh yeah, completely different. I mean, I, the, this movie that I did years ago, 41 years ago, Animal House. I've seen it in people's homes with four people, and I've seen it in movie theaters just in the past year with uh, 2,000 people at the Grumman's or a thousand. I don't know how many at Grumman's Chinese in uh, New York in L.A. And the difference is is yeah is remarkable yeah it really is so all right so let's and, go ahead and a lot of filmmakers i i have no i i've never watched a film on my what's that called iphone on your iphone or on your ipad or anything like that. I, or ipad i've watched movies on my uh what is this called that i'm talking on now my your, laptop yeah your lap regular on your laptop yeah yeah um I've watched movies on those. I mean, I, I know I sound like I'm really old. I can't even remember the name of this. Uh, but I, they have so many iPhone, iPad, i. Yeah. What is, this is a laptop. This is a, Mac, Mac, a MacBook yeah, Pro. Mac laptop. Yep. Yeah. So I've watched movies on those, and I don't like it, and I feel bad that I'm watching it because – Filmmakers, I mean, how do you watch it? How do you watch Lawrence of Arabia on no, this yeah, on a screen yeah. that's fifteen inches wide? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. I find myself too, you know, now these days, especially when it's a when it's kind of an epic film. Uh, when I go to the theater, I I will wait or whatever, try to see it on you know in their IMAX, like the the super large screen, and because yeah. I just want to see it and I want to be kind of uh, 
brought into into the movie, not just uh, viewing it on a you know something the size of your phone or your iPad or whatever. Uh, yeah, there's there's a, it's a whole different experience, you know. That that's how the uh, I mean Picasso didn't paint Guernica to be seen uh, in a book. He painted it to be seen on a wall in front of you where it overwhelms you. Exactly. And Monet with the water lilies and everything like that. But exactly. uh, all those. So the artist has an intention, and we have to try to respect the artist's intention. I agree. I agree. Um, oh, let's talk. Okay, like, you know, and, and we'll get a little oh, lighter here. Oh, now. Frank, did you watch The Irishman? I did. Did you see it on the big screen, or did you see I, it? No, I, I actually, I watched it. Uh, I didn't have a chance to see it in a theater, and I did watch it um, on Netflix on my television. I know I have a sixty-inch, you know, television, so yeah, um, so it, it was a little better. But I would have liked to have seen it in the theater, but I just I didn't have a chance to do it. And it was, you know, the problem is it, it, it was easier for me to watch it on Netflix, right? Yeah, no, it's it, it's easier, and it was and it was that's the way it, it was made. I mean, I, Scorsese, I think, did a pretty remarkable thing besides all the the cgi and the aging and the de-aging and all that's mm. that's that gimmicky stuff a pretty remarkable thing because he shot it and made it i think so it works both ways it works on the uh, on the big screen mm -hmm. and it also works on your 35 inch or 42 inch or 60 inch uh television screen yeah. because it's uh, i mean you get a you're, there's a lot more close-ups Oh, you're wet. My dog just came in. <laughs> is it raining out there, Mike? Uh, I guess it is. It must uh -huh. be. Is it raining? It must be raining. My son just came in, too. Gotcha. I'm doing an interview. Julius. Hi, Julius. Julius. Frank says hi, Julius. Hello. Oh, I want one of my the, the real good straw. Thanks. Anyway, okay, go ahead. So, no, no. Uh, so I just wanted to go into, light. I wanted to talk a little bit, you know, and just kind of going down the same path. Talk a little bit about uh, your support of indie film. I mean, I worked with you on an independent film, and I know you've done Hollywood films and big budget films and everything, but you always seem to be very supportive and uh, very encouraging uh, to indie filmmakers. I know you just finished The Field with uh, Tate Bunker not that Tate, long yeah. ago, and I know Tate. And, um, you know, I. Second, second film I've made with Tate, and we made one called A Little Red, and then. Right. Uh, the I remember that yeah. also. So, what, what is, what's your, you know, I, why do you support independent film? I mean, what's what's your your thought on that? Um, the reason I do is because because they'll hire me. <laughs> I know <laughs> that's part of it, but uh, the, the, and the baseline truth of it. But the reason I really like them is because there's a. Uh, it's like working off off Broadway in New York as opposed to working Broadway. Broadway is really nice. Uh, just like big movies are really nice. The craft service table is always filled with good stuff on Friday. You might even get sushi. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But I don't go to the craft service table anyway, cause, cause I'm working. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, and I don't, uh, if they play a, do a big spread at a Broadway theater between your two, your two mat, your matinee and your evening show on Sunday, I will, I'm not going to eat it anyway. I'm going to eat a little, a couple of of things of lettuce because I don't want to have my stomach full. I don't want to be processed. This is all by way of saying that I like being hungry. I like the 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 attitude of we've got to get this by five o'clock because the guy's coming to take his camera back. That's a little more, a little more incentive to it, right? Yeah, you're you're driven a little bit more by need, whereas in the big thank you, in the big Hollywood things. You're dri the, the drive is need for money. You're dri driven more by the need to express yourself, the need to communicate, the need to just to make a movie. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the big Hollywood stuff and television, it's really about uh, it's really about making money for the most part. I mean, they still do. I don't watch television anymore, but they still do commercials, don't they? Oh yeah, and and it's all about making money and saving money, right? I mean, it's uh, you know how can we do this more efficiently? It may not be the best way, but we can make it cheaper this way, right? We can make it cheaper this way, but they don't. They're not so worried about that on the big budget movies because they've got a lot of money. They spend money on sushi for oh, the craft service table or something like that. They spend money in unnecessary, wasteful places, 
but they spend money fair and they give you, you know, they give you, a, I don't know what per diem is now on a big Hollywood movie, a hundred dollars a day or something like that, depending on where you're shooting. Right. They give you, they give you lots of money. They pay you ridiculous amounts of money yeah. to do, yeah. uh, you know, a big, a big budget money. And from what the, but, from the work atmosphere, Mark, you know, what, what's the, you know, and I know there's, there's, there's ones that are very evident, but. Uh, on a, in the work atmosphere and working with a director and working with a crew, what are the what are the pros and cons on each side? I mean, what do you like about doing a Hollywood big budget, and what do you like about indie and and the differences there? Well, you talk about time. You don't have much time on low budget independent movies, and time is really valuable because you can rehearse, you can develop relationships with the people that you're supposed to have relationships with in the story. So it's nice to have that time. Uh, and in big budget movies, if you're part of the main cast, you do have more time. You're liable to even get a chance to rehearse for a week or two or three weeks. I mean, I, some of the really good directors rehearse for a long time and they, and they work with an actor, with the lead actor or the lead actors for a long time, discussing the character, talking. And I love to sit around. So I like the theater so much. I love to sit around and and talk about this and how does this work and what's this relationship like and make up a backstory and share that backstory. And, and, you know, if you're married to somebody work out what, uh, how you met and worked out, work out all the little details of a relationship that make that relationship, uh, a marriage. But so I, so I like that. I like ha having that time. And in low budget independence, you don't always have that much time. On the other hand, you have the energy from we've got to get this, so we better get it right, and we better be flexible about what we think is right. Mm -hmm. So that shortened time is a negative in that you don't have time to sort of really deepen things, but it's also a positive because it lights a fire under you. Right. Right. I mean, you, you've got to be there and it, give, and it makes you more spontaneous and more uh, just more spontaneous, more improvisational. You know, Mark, I know a lot about your acting and, and believe it or not, I mean, I've, I've looked up quite a few things and you, the, the amount of work you've done in television and movies is pretty amazing. And I think, you know, everybody, you know, we always everybody always names the three things, right? They, they name the animal house and they name you know, uh, maestro and they name, uh, the master and whatever, but, um, you know, Jackie O and I'm, uh, there's a, there's a bunch of work out there that, um, you know, I, I'll be watching movies sometimes and all of a sudden you'll pop up on a screen. I'm like, Oh my gosh, there's Mark. Holy cow. Look at that. I never knew you were in that film and, and the performance I think I'm always impressed with, but, um, I think, you know, what, Thanks. what I'm, I'm curious about is, you know, what kind of, I mean, did you set out, to to be in the theater did you set out to say hey you know what i i i want to go out and i want to be in movies or i want to be in television or you know kind of and and you don't have to give me a full story in this i'm just kind of looking for you know what what was kind of your dream and did you hit the dream or did did it take a, a side path that still turned out great or how did that work out for you oh well it's a long story um <laughs> No, I, I, I started out to do the theater. I wanted to do the I started out in college as an engineer, but I ended up in the theater because it was fun and the women were friendlier. <laughs> but, uh, and when I got out of college, it was Vietnam, and I had to hide out from the draft. I had no intention of doing it as a career. And for the first five years that I was living in New York and working pretty regularly in the theater, I refused to do, I refused to even audition for television or movies because I wanted to do Shakespeare. I wanted to do Sophocles. I wanted to do Ibsen. I wanted to do Chekhov. I wanted to do Sam Shepard. I wanted to do Terrence McNally. I wanted to do theater, live theater. But eventually, uh, I was somebody asked me to do a short film from based on a Catherine Mansfield short story. And I liked literature. I love literature. And then I got asked to do a film by, uh, uh, that Fred Zinnemann directed. And I, and I went to England for six weeks. I worked for three days, got paid a lot of money for six weeks, got a per diem, stayed in a nice hotel. And I got kind of seduced by all yeah. that. Well, it's they not hard. Really. It's not. They treat, yeah. And I thought, well, here, this is what movies are like. You work for three days. You live in London for six weeks. You get to travel to Europe or to Ireland and Scotland, you know, when you're down. And uh, they pay for it. And uh, I thought it was always going to be like that. Not always like that. <laughs> um, 
so I, I got seduced. And I, there's a short film that played at Sundance this year called Character. It also played at the Big Sky Film Festival in uh, Missoula, Montana, and Aspen Shorts Fest. It's, it's playing a lot of selected good film festivals. To, it's an experimental documentary by a woman named Vera Brunner Sung, and it's about mm -hmm. my life and my career in the, uh, in the theater. It's about 20 minutes long. Really? And the thread of it, the main arc of the narrative that she's sort of chosen to follow is how I sold out, but nobody was buying. I, I went to Hollywood to sell out and uh, nobody was buying, but they were in fact buying. I did Animal House, but I've done, those three that you mentioned are relatively different, but I've done that Animal House character over and over and over and over and over and over again, yeah. many, many times. Sure. Because they pay American money. Yeah. Yeah. And because I can do it, although I don't do it anymore. And uh, so I, to, in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm bitter, probably. I probably am bitter. Uh, a little bit resentful, but it, it was my own doing. I mean, I, I let myself get seduced. Yeah. And I went, I took the money and I took the, uh, the limos and I took the first class airfare and I took all that nice treatment, all that, uh, those nice back rubs and foot rubs <laughs> and going in your ear that they give you. Well, that's hard to resist, right? I mean, I, I, I don't think many people, I think I always, I always, um, I look at the, the idea of celebrity, you know, and, and, you know, and I'm sure you've experienced this, that, you know, I think the hardest part of that is, um, you know, that all of a sudden you're popular and everybody wants you, right? And you, you don't know anymore who's authentic, who wants to be your friend because they like you or who wants to be your friend because you're famous or, who, you know, that whole part of it, I think, would be really unnerving for me. Um, and that's why I'm sure you see a lot of people and maybe yourself included that you go back to old friends you had before you had that fame and before you were well known, uh, because at least, you know, those are the people that liked you then. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I, I think that's that's the that's the least of it, though. The, really? the hardest part about celebrity and fame is that there's a tendency to believe it. Yeah. There's a tendency to think that you actually are owed it or earned it yeah. or something like that. Uh, so that when it go, I mean, I find if I go a week without somebody recognizing me, I feel a little depressed, mm. but, but I'm an idiot yeah. feeling that <laughs> because there, there's this cult of celebrity that we have in this country. And it's, I think it's kind of almost unique in this country. I, I, actors in England are really thought of as craftsmen, yeah. as people who go to work. They're not that, and it, it, it's kind of romantic to think it, but to say it, but they're, 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 they're craftsmen. They're like a plumber. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ian, Ian McKellen is, is a really top notch plumber. If you've got a clog and you can get Ian McKellen, get him there. Yeah. He'll get it yeah. out. And he is one of and my it'll favorites. Be fun while he's doing it. <laughs> He is one of my um, favorite plumbers, by the way. <laughs> he's, uh, he's a good plumber. Now that Paul Schofield's dead, he's a very good plumber. Good, good plumber. So um, uh, let's talk yeah, a little uh, bit about, and because, you know, I, I'd be remiss, and I'm sure people will be bugging me if I don't ask you about some of these things. So it, I think it was, uh, when I looked it up, you did uh, you did the master in Buffy and the Vampire Slayer around 1997, I believe that was. I um, think it was 97, yeah. And I want to ask you a little bit about prosthetics. Um, okay. that was, I mean, that was heavy prosthetics, right? I mean, and, and then, uh, in 1998, well, very specific about the word heavy, they were is really very light. Yeah. I but mean, I, very, I mean, heavy, I mean, you know what I mean? Heavy, I mean, heavy, like, I think you were, you were wearing contacts, you had full face, you had, I right. mean, it, it, it was, uh, it was something. And then in, in 1998, it, it, you must've not been completely turned out for it because in 1998 you did Star Trek. And you took right. a, a spot as a, a medic. I just watched it the other day. And again, wrote, you know, medic, yeah. oh, over, and I'm thinking, you know, it does. And, and I've heard two, two sides to this of, of other people that, that have done parts where they have to wear a lot of prosthetic is, do you think it's a help for you to get into character and to act? Or is it a, I got to try to get myself through it and, and ignore it. Or I, or does it become part of you and the character? How do how do you handle that? 
Well, one, when you're in an act, when you're in acting school, you take a lot of classes doing mask work and mask work is re is really great. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if the prosthetic is well applied and uh, uh, made of good material and really professionally done, it's like a really great mask. And it's wonderful to act behind a mask anyway. I mean, it liberates you in lots of ways, liberates your voice liberates your body, it liberates everything about you to be behind this mask. Not because you're hidden, but yeah, because you're hidden, because it's not really you. It's something, it's, it's this layer of skin that's laid on top of you. And in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, it was exactly like that. It was just like a layer of skin. It was a thin layer of foam, a skull cap, two ears, a neck piece. Took five hours to get into it because they're very careful to put it into it. You use that time. If you use it wisely, you just meditate because you can't talk because they're painting and you can murmur things if you have input. But basically, you just sort of go into a, get into a, 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 a meditative state mm -hmm. and think lower and lower into yourself and into the character and find where you are. And, that be, and that's great. Uh, Star Trek was ridiculous because they cast those Herosians. They wanted... They wanted them all to be seven feet tall, oh. and they went full body foam, so they all look big and huge and muscular. It was a warrior, a warrior class, and uh, they quickly ran out of seven foot tall actors and ended up with the six foot two all uh, six foot two inch actors like myself. But they didn't want to spend money to make new costumes for them, so they weren't made specifically for my body. Neither the face piece, the head piece, or the full body. It was somebody else's. It smelled like somebody else. Oh, gosh. It smelled like somebody who was seven feet tall and sweated a lot. And I lost 15 pounds. It weighed, I think, 70 pounds. Oh, my gosh. The whole thing. So I'm carrying extra. And they just sort of put it on you, slap it on you, gather it around the back, pull it together, and tell you, don't turn your back to the camera because we don't want them to see that this thing is actually three sizes too big for you. Right, right, right. So, well, it was great makeup. I mean, it, you know, it looked it looked it looked great and in and in fact, yeah. the point that uh, you know, I I was having trouble. I was trying to pick you out. You were in the opening credits and I was like and I was trying to listen cuz you do have you do have some some very characteristic things in your voice and I could hear it in there just barely and I that's how I was able to kind of pick you out. But uh, yeah. I it was I thought it was uh it was well done, but I I just Boy, yeah, acting with with all of that on you is uh, I I just think has to be a challenge, just an unbelievable challenge. So, yeah, it, it is. I mean, and 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 to I'm glad you liked it. I mean, I think it is. I I don't know if I've ever seen it. And I've seen that that Star Trek. I think I did see some of it, but it it is good. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's a subtle difference, Frank, because it's one of the reasons I like the theater. In the theater, a friend, old friend of mine said the difference between acting in theater and acting in movies is in theater you can be shot. Mm. <laughs> so just that just that that knowledge that somebody out there could think your performance is so bad that he could <laughs> shoot you. But you could flip that around because the audience can be shot too. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's that. So we, we, we all, when we're in that event, we all should be living with the idea that... Uh, Life can disappear any minute, and there's an edge, that gives it an edge. It's really nice to know that, to have that edge, because it makes it very important, and it makes it important to be authentic. And when you're doing something like Star Trek, and, and Buffy was nice, even though it was obviously a television show, but the place where I lived was uh, uh, underground, under a church that had been buried in an earthquake. And for the first, I think, five or six episodes, they had had it filled with real dust and real dirt. People started getting sick, and they had to clean it up. But there was a real authentic feel to it. In Star Trek, everything is just a flat. Everything is just, uh, just it's just for show. It's just for the camera. Yeah. Like I said before, you're, you're wearing something that's, that's two, three sizes too big for you, gathered behind and with big clamps back there to hold it, and you can't turn your back to the audience. You can't do a turn. They have all you those have restrictions right on top of it, right? Yeah, it's just, it's just a two-dimensional universe. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do as actors, as performers, 
is is create a three dimensional or a four dimensional if you've got those kind of powers uh, experience for the people who are sitting in the audience. You want them to be so connected to it that it's that it's absolutely real. And you know, you know what's funny, Mark is um, I read an I read a uh, a quote from Joss. Uh, I think Joss Whedon. Do you remember he was a creator? Of, uh, yeah. And it was funny. It, it said that so many people had auditioned for the master. They had a lot of people auditioned. And the reason you ended up getting the part from uh, his standpoint was he said that Mark brought a sly and urban sensitivity and charm to the character. Huh. That's very nice of him to say. I wish he'd said that to me. <laughs> well, I was thinking, I was, you know, here you, you've got this person covered in prosthetics and whatever. And I think the, the cool thing is that he was able to pull that out and say, OK, with all that on and, and you're going to bring this charm and this sensitivity to the character, which is the whole reason you ended up getting it out of. And I don't know. Do you remember? Do you remember it all? uh, uh Going and auditioning for that? Oh yeah, I do. I remember talking to the casting agent too um, afterwards, and she after the audition, which was an audition and an interview, mm -hmm. and it went went very nicely. And afterwards, she said, "You know, you're not going to get this part. I just brought you in." And she explained to me what casting directors do when they, when they can't figure out what it is that the director wants, mm -hmm. they'll bring in lots of pe as many people as they can find that they're pretty sure he doesn't want. In other words, it's like bracketing. If you're shooting, if you're artillery in the, in the Navy or the Army, you bracket it. You, yeah, you yeah, know, you sure. A little to the right here and a little. So they just try to narrow those, bring those brackets in. And I was one of those guys that she brought in that she thought, it'll never catch this guy. Interesting. Well, you, know? you showed her, I guess. I, 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 listened, I heard him and I see, I'd read the script and, I got an idea in my head, and uh, and and he was very collaborative too. I mean, he he had envisioned the master with sort of long, uh, dark hair, and I wanted. I asked him if we could maybe sort of honor some of the early vampires, and so I I said, why don't we make him look a little bit more Nosferatu? Oh, that's a, you know that's great that you had that input on it. I, I was going to ask you a little bit about that too because I wanted to move on to. Um, so talking about Seinfeld and how that happened for you, um, you know the the I, I loved the Maestro. I mean that that show was was so different than anything else that was on TV. And they, and even when they brought in when they brought in new characters, um, the characters all kind of fit into that mold of being something different and being just a little quirky and and things like that. So when you went, how did that come about? How did you end up getting that? Was that something you went after, or did they come to you? And did you have a, a chance to? To put your mark on it, did you have? Did you say, "Hey, I, I think this guy should be like this"? Or how did that come about, Mark? You mean Buffy? The, no, the I'm not, the, no, we're, we're we're talking about the Maestro now in Seinfeld. Okay. Yeah, no, I think I auditioned probably with five hundred other people. Wow. Um, for that part, uh, I auditioned on a Thursday. I thought I'd hear by Friday. I didn't hear anything. I, oh no, I guess I did hear late Friday. They want to see you. Again, so I went on Friday, didn't hear anything on Saturday till late in the day. They want to see you again. I went three times for callbacks. Mm -hmm. And uh, on Sunday, I got it and I went to work on Monday. So wow. they weren't, they didn't come after me. Uh, my agent found the audition and submitted me and they said, yeah, we'll look at him. But I think there were something like 500 people to wow. begin with. Well, it was great casting because I think that that was a perfect, perfect part. And I, and I, I really that, enjoyed that. Frank, that, you think that because I'm a good actor. That's, that's why. Well, that, take it for what it is. That, that's exactly that's, right. That's it, the job, to make people yeah. think, that's him. Yeah. He's got it perfectly. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, well, it, I'm it was, joking. It was, it was well done. Hey, I, I, I also read another interview, um, and just to, to back up a little bit, because I, and we can kind of uh, put this together in the way you kind of approach your parts and, and how you get into a part. I don't know if you consider yourself a method actor, but one of the pieces I wrote uh, uh, read about you was when you were doing Animal House that you, uh, everybody who was staying in the hotel, you went and stayed in a room right above all the guys who were playing uh, the Delta, kind of your enemies in that, in that film. And, um, and you went above, and they were partying at night and keeping you up at night, and you would shine your boots and sit up and read your script and just kind of let the anger build so that you could use it uh, in the scenes. Is that, is that valid? That, that's true. That's, that's what I did. 
that's what I did. That's what, yeah. so do you I mean, consider all, that method? Is that kind of a method acting thing? Or well, what? I mean, people call it method. Landis always teases John Landis, who directed it, uh, and I've worked with him about five times, I think. He always uh, teases me about being a method actor. But in truth, every actor who's working and who works fairly regularly is a method actor because they have their own method that they've developed. I, what uh, Elliot Gould used to play cards all the time, play poker. Um, different people do different things. Some people spend all day at the craft service table talking to people, and then they go do the job. Uh, I like to immerse myself in the character as much as I can 24-7 for as long as I can and, and take breaks and go to dinner and flirt with somebody and uh, uh, fall in love maybe, but only one night a week. <laughs> if I don't have to work the next day. Because right. it's right. all, for me, it's just all the work. I'll listen to music, I'll read books that, that point me towards what I think the character is and what the time and the place is and, and the situation. So yeah, I just, I need to immerse myself because I'm not, I mean, I know I said a few minutes ago because I'm a good actor, but what I mean is because I, I, I do the work. Right. Um, that's why you think that. But because I'm not, an, I'm not, I'm a, not a natural at it. It's not, it's not, you know, right in my ballpark all the time. I really love it and I like it doing it better than anything, but it takes work. It's hard work and it, uh, oh, yeah. you have to suffer with it. Yeah, that's interesting. Hey, um, the, the one more thing I want to, I want to bring up and, and uh, this is really going back now, like uh, 1983. Do you remember shooting the final terror? Oh, Sure. I watched you know, a piece of that, night. and I was impressed with you that. in that in that movie. I was, I know it's an older, longer movie, but I was really impressed with your performance in there. I thought you you were just great. Thanks. It was fun to do. Um, that woman I got to work with, Cindy Harrell, you know, she was a model. She was beautiful, and she was uh, she was fun to work with. And all those great cast. I mean, Rachel Ward's in that movie. Daryl Hannah, Hannah, yeah. Movie. Joe Pantoliano, right? Uh, Joe, Joe was in there. Yeah. Pants. John Friedrich was a wonderful actor. He was in The Wanderer, and then he plays the kind of tough guy. He's really good. He's mm -hmm. quit the business. I think he's a psychologist or a psychiatrist really. down in Texas somewhere now. Uh, Adrian yeah. Zmed, who went on and did uh, some television show, Hooker. Or oh, something yeah, like yeah, T.J. Hooker, right? Yep. Right, right. And, oh, and that some guy, a guy named Lewis, who I worked in, worked with again on, uh, on uh, uh, the movie with Jane Kaczmarek. What's it called? Uh, geez, geez. I can't remember. Yeah, I can't think. Yeah, but anyway. I, but I really, I, you know, I started watching that because I was kind of looking at your filmography and, and looking through it. I'm like, wow, what's this? And I, I started watching. It's like, wow, you, you know, that was, uh, that was a great performance. I, I really thought, you know, you, you came across so genuine, and I, you know, I, and I'm thinking, well, this is pretty early in your career. Maybe you're still put, and but boy, you were great. You know, and I'm, I don't mean to blow Thanks. smoke up your butt here, but it really, I thought it was really actually good, really, really good. Thanks. It was fun. It's nice. It was nice to do a character who wasn't uh, a bad guy. I think by that time I made that picture, I'd already made Animal House. Okay. And yeah, I, I think, th I, and that's I probably, I think why it. I liked it, Mark. I think, you know, because it was kind of off type for you, at least from where you were, where, where they were putting you. And I thought, boy, you know, this, this is actually something different. You came across really well. I, I really, Oh, good. It. Thanks a lot. Too bad. I'm not young and pretty anymore. I can't <laughs> yeah, yeah. None, none of us are young and pretty again. anymore, Mark. <laughs> You're pretty, than, prettier than most, but Hey, listen, I think um, unless there's anything else you want to add to this, I, I really enjoyed our conversation today. And, and oh, it's good. so Thanks. great to catch up with you. And, and hopefully we talked to talked off off a little bit of, of the normal stuff that you usually get asked. It's hard. I'm sure you for all of the interviews you've done, I'm sure you've been asked the same question over and over and over and over just to quote you again. <laughs> and uh, I try to find some things to talk about that maybe you hadn't talked about before, but it's not easy, Thanks. my friend. Yeah, it was very nice. It was very pleasant. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, I really appreciate you uh, doing this. And um, thanks again for uh, for the time and good luck in your move. And uh, and hopefully uh, we'll talk again soon. Yeah, I'm sure we will. Thanks, Frank. Right. Thank thanks you, a lot. Mark. Take care. Yeah. Bye. So that was Mark Metcalf. Uh, I really appreciate him taking the time. He is in the process of moving from Ohio to Oregon, I believe, um, and still working and doing all of those things. So from sunny, sunny Palm Springs, as you can see, that's a live shot 
uh, out my patio window. Um, I say goodbye to everyone, and I hope you enjoyed our conversation. And please uh, look forward to conversation number three coming up in about a week. Thanks, everybody.